All right. Good morning. Today is February 23rd, 1999, and I am about to interview Ian McCunn as part of a continuing series of talks with World War II veterans sponsored by the Tri-Corners History Council. I am Edward Nickerson, and the unseen man behind the camera is Fred Hall, like me, also a veteran of the war. Ian McCunn, who served as an officer in the Merchant Marine, is a retired engineer and makes his home in Canaan. We need to remember as a background that Nazi Germany had invaded the Soviet Union in June, uh, in June of 1941, and that for at least two years the Russian army, not the British or the Americans, was doing most of the fighting against the Germans. If Russia fell, it would have been disaster for the rest of the Western Allies. Therefore, huge convoys braved the North Atlantic to take supplies to the Russians at Murmansk and other northern ports. Places like Leningrad were closed by the Germans. Ian McKin McCunn was on those convoys. These videotapes, I should add, will be available to the interviewees and their families and also will be publicly available for educational purposes. They will not be used uh, for commercial purposes. And I'd like to just point out before we start that uh, this is the Atlantic and the Murmansk run, which was the only way to get supplies to Russia, came from the United States to Scotland or other ports around the top of Norway. Finland was entirely on the German side, occupied by the Germans, down to Murmansk and other ports down here. Murmansk was ice-free. There were other ports that were ice-bound, and they got to them through icebreakers. And I thought it would be helpful to see how far out of the way and way up near the Arctic, up on the level with Iceland, these convoys had to travel. Well, I would like to start by asking you uh, where you would like to start. Well, How did you get involved in the Norwegian Marine and so forth? Uh, I went to the New York State Maritime Academy at Fort Schuyler in uh, July of 1942 and graduated uh, on January 5th, 1944 uh, with a third mate's license and an ensign's commission in the Naval Reserve. Uh, I opted to go on merchant ships. Um, my first ship uh, was, by my own choice, it was the uh, John W. Powell, a Liberty ship. And I knew it was going to uh, Murmansk, and uh, I kind of felt the war was passing me by at that time, and I wanted to be where there was some war taking place that I was pretty certain I would see. Uh, so we left uh, New York uh, around Jan uh, January 10th or so, and we sailed... Of uh, 19... 1944. And we sailed uh, to uh, the Clyde in Scotland, which is near Glasgow. I had an opportunity to visit my grandmother and some relatives over there at that time. Then we uh, went up uh, between the outer and the inner Hebrides, uh, west of Skye to a, a, a large uh, sea loch uh, named Loch Yu, and we formed a convoy there of I think something like 40 or 41 ships and a tanker and a tremendous escort. Right, let me interrupt a minute. What is a sea loch? A loch uh, is a lake. Yes, uh, well that's a land loch. Land loch. <laughs> land loch loch. loch. You have to have a little touch a of sea lock would be a kind of a huge harbor. A sea lock would be open to the ocean. Okay. And uh, we left there. Uh, it's just just about just fifty five years ago on the twentieth of uh, February, uh, with forty one ships, I think, and a tanker, and we had a large escort. It was. Uh, one of the largest escorts they've ever had. I think there were 17 destroyers. There was a light cruiser. It was all British, an all British convoy, both the Atlantic and the Arctic run. 
uh, 17 destroyers and the HMS Black Prince, which was a light cruiser, and an American-built uh, uh, small carrier, uh, the HMS Chaser. It had swordfish, which were bi-wing planes, uh, old-fashioned looking things, but they were good for submarine search. And it had some fighter planes. And we left from there and headed up toward Murmansk. We had to stay well off the uh, Norwegian coast because it was occupied by the Germans. Uh, I want to say at this point that the most dangerous runs uh, with the most casualties were in 1942. Mm -hmm. uh, we were a very well-armed ship. Liberty ships were very well-armed. They had uh, a three-inch gun forward, a five-inch aft, and six 20 millimeters. They had a degaussing cable, which I think all naval and merchant vessels had at that time, which was uh, demagnetized the ship against mines, and magnetic mines. Uh, well, we were out a few days, and uh, I'd say around the 23rd, uh, a German plane spotted the convoy, and they, in turn, sent a message as to where we were, and uh, a column of 14 submarines uh, intercepted us. They, they were lying in our path. None of this I knew at the time. Uh, this is after the fact. You learn so much more about things. And uh, on the 25th, uh, about 11 o'clock on my watch at night, uh, I saw a red light to the starboard. And a red light only means one thing uh, during blackout conditions in the war. It means I've been torpedoed. Well, I hit the panic alarm, and everybody went to their stations. And uh, it turned out to be the HMS Maharata, Maharata, I believe. It was a destroyer. Uh, the radio man, or the radio operator on the destroyer, sent a radio message to the convoy. We had speakers, and every ship had a speaker, so you could hear it on the bridge. That uh, they had been hit by a torpedo in the stern. And moments later, he said something else about another torpedo, and then the whole sky lit up. They were hitting the magazine, and that was the end. They had over 200 men on the crew, and only a few survived. The water temperature was always below 32 degrees, uh, probably 28, 29 degrees being salt water. Salt water didn't yeah. freeze, yeah. Uh, there were other attacks by submarines, but uh, no ships were sunk. Uh, but two, two, or two submarines were definitely sunk. And uh, one by a Catalina from the Shetlands at the limit of its range. That's a flying boat? Uh, the fly yeah, that was an American. Yeah. Bus, uh, flown by the, I suppose, the RAF or the Royal Navy. And uh, the, the seas were always rough. It was quite dark. Uh, there was sunlight, but when the sun was up, it was very low on the horizon at that time of the year. And uh, the temperatures were always between 10 and 20 below zero. And the further north we got, with seas breaking over the bow, uh, the more ice we started to build up. Pretty soon, all forward guns were useless. We didn't have to use them, fortunately, but they were all useless, and, and the whole foredeck was useless because it was just caked with ice. The bow actually went down on its marks. Uh, I don't know how much, but it, it did drop a bit from the tons of ice that you collect. This was true of every ship, especially the, the small escorts. And then we arrived in the Kola Inlet, which is the uh, outlet of the Kola River, uh, down which Murmansk is located, and that was the main port. Well, we didn't go there. I never so did. Let me uh, get the idea. You have gone at this point around the top of Norway. And yes. Come back down. Yes. Towards. Well off the coast, and we circled just below Bear Island. Mm -hmm. uh, we were about 900 miles from the pole, still in ice-free water, mm -hmm. right down into uh, Murmansk, which is ice-free year-round. That's why it's there as a base. Uh, and seven of us, uh, we laid at anchor for oh, maybe four or five days, 
And then seven ships and three Russian icebreakers, all British made. I remember the names, the Stalin, the Lenin, and I don't remember the small one. But it required the aid of the big ones once we got into the White Sea because it, it got iced up just like we did. And we would f follow these, <coughs> excuse me, icebreakers uh, through the openings that they would make. Uh, and at times we would be get, not frozen in, but jammed in. And the icebreaker would come back and break us free. And uh, this was all in the White Sea. Uh, and we finally arrived at the port of Molotovsk, which was named after uh, uh, the then uh, foreign, minister. foreign minister of uh, the Soviets. Uh, it's since been renamed to a big, long Russian name. He's been in disfavor all that time. And then we uh, discharged cargo there. And there were, uh, there were several little humorous incidents. Uh, one was, uh, I had to go to Archangel twice, I think we all went, and you went on a very primitive little train through a forest. It was like a step back in time. And the, the train stopped uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, at the uh, Divina River, and you walked across this river on the ice for about a mile with all the other people to Archangel. Well, as we were leaving the station uh, early in the morning in Molotovsk, some of the fellows were horsing around, and one of them grabbed a yellow icicle. I didn't see it, but knows it was yellow. And you know where yellow icicles come from? It was under this primitive little wooden car, and that was where the toilet was. And they handed it to me, and jokingly, I went like this across my face with it, and I licked it. <laughs> and the, the, some of the few Russians that were standing around, the Russians do laugh. And even I had to laugh, and it broke everybody else up. Uh, the other thing was, uh, when I, I had to go to Murmansk, uh, because the bosun went crazy. He had been torpedoed, and I guess he had reason for being uh, a little nutty. But uh, a lot of old-time seamen drank a lot, and their, their minds weren't always that well. This guy went over the edge, and he went after the chief officer, uh, Olaf Osterwald, with a, an, an axe. Well, he didn't get him, and for some reason or other, he liked me. Uh, maybe I was like the his son. Yeah. And it was my job to take him to the only medical facility in northern Russia that was... Uh, either English or American, I happen to be a British uh, uh, doctor, and uh, all the way across on the train, he would. He, he, we we all wore uh, real heavy weather gear, mm -hmm. and he had one of these hats, like a Russian hat, and he'd let it hang down the tabs, and he'd walk up and down on this little, like a cattle cart, and he'd go up to a Russian, and he'd go, yeah, like that, and they startle and they, they realized what was this guy was mad too so uh, I ended up in the doctor's office after a mad ride by a Russian driver in a jeep and I sat in the ante room and uh, I think he was a lieutenant commander or a lieutenant commander in the Royal Navy and and he sat there and, and was starting to interview this man I had already told him that yeah it's crazy the guy was absolutely normal, and I was fit to be tied because now I'm stuck with this guy who's normal and he's going to go back to the ship with me. Then I saw him go like this, and that's all it took. <laughs> the doctor diagnosed his problem pretty promptly. I don't remember how he got back to the ship, uh, but we did have to keep him locked up, and uh, I guess we dropped him off in Scotland when we got back there. But that was another little incident. And uh, Archangel was interesting in that uh, in, any, in any of the two ports that I was in, there was always, and I th think throughout Russia, loudspeakers, and it was all propaganda. We're, yeah. we're certain of that. But it ha also had classical music, Tchaikovsky. I recognized some, some of the music. And uh, they blared all the time. Another thing that I sensed was the smell of their terrible cigarettes. And years later, walking down Fifth Avenue, I had a sniff. 
And I turned around and there were some Russian officers, probably from the UN, and it was the same smells. The only place I ever smelled it. I don't know what kind of tobacco it was, but it was unique. And the and the uh, the poverty and the hardships we we saw. Uh, uh, How about pr the bureaucracy? Prison prison camps for yeah. civilians. We were told not to interfere with anything because uh, seamen, both navy and merchantmen, uh, had been interned by the Russians for horsing around or doing things they weren't supposed to. So it was a big warning notice before you left the ship. Keep your nose clean. Uh, well, this was, this was the, con the convoy? This was the convoy, and, and it was written up in the New York Times. Okay, I'll hold this up. Uh, this is uh, May 20th. 1944. Allies win fierce convoy fight in Arctic. Two U-boats sunk, others hit, and convoy arrives intact. Okay. Uh, well, now that was, was that the, uh, the only run you took to Burmansk? Yes. I just want to say one thing about sure. clothing. Uh, merchantmen had to provide all their own clothing. And not all of them knew that they were going to Russia. I did because uh, we, we, we just had inside information. And uh, I, I prepared myself somewhat with warm clothing. I bought uh, uh, heavy wool underwear. And that's just a short story. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Some British woman's merchant seaman's service, if I'm correct, supplied us with uh, rubber boots with felt liners, uh, heavy pants with suspenders, and heavy oilskin uh, coats with uh, sheepskin lining and sheepskin helmets that came right around your face. And Did you get those in Scotland? Those were issued to us in Scotland and we were, t we were returned when we got back to Scotland. Uh, the, the one incident about my long underwear is kind of humorous. We used to do our washing whenever we could in a place called the Fiddly. Now the Fiddly is a section of the ship high up that surrounds the, the stack. And when you stand in the fiddly, you look through gratings and downstairs, and you can, down below, you can see roughly where the boiler room is. And it's nice and hot up there, and there was a uh, petcock with a hose on it uh, with raw steam. These were steam vessels, reciprocating steam engines, um, three cylinders. And uh, you would take and fill your... Uh, a, a bucket with water, put the steam hose in, and in no time at all you had boiling water and your clothes were clean. No soap or anything like that. Well, I did this with my long underwear. And my mother never told me what happens to long underwear or any underwear or anything that's made of wool. It came out half size. I could never get in it again. Another thing, uh, I did have a second pair though. And you never get out of your clothes on this trip and to speak of very, very shortly. Another thing that was supplied to us was an immersion suit, much like the uh, skin divers use today, mm -hmm. only it was heavy rubber, and it had a zipper, as I remember, and a helmet that went over your hat, all one piece. All that was exposed was your hands, and it took forever to get into them. So uh, we all did get into them occasionally, but mm -hmm. they were so uncomfortable that they were almost useless, and, you wouldn't have survived very long with or without them, I don't think. Uh -huh. And that's, uh, that was pretty much the extent of that, uh, that trip. The uh, fighters on the aircraft kept the uh, enemy planes away. They did attack, and they were on the horizon, and there were fights. And oh yes, and w the Tirpitz was always a threat, because the trip, two trips before was when the Shonhurst was sunk. Yeah. That was in December, just before Christmas. The Tirpitz was based? The Tirpitz was placed in the Alton Fjord, yeah, way up north in the Alton Fjord. It was ultimately sunk by the by British bombers. They tried for years and they finally did sink it in Tromsø. And uh, because of that threat, that's why Hitler kept it up there, because it kept part of the home fleet in the British Isles. Just, just that one threat of that one big ship coming out and attacking a convoy, which it did airily in the war, but not 
at this particular time. So the home fleet had some heavy cruisers and a, a fleet that shadowed us maybe 200, 100, 200 miles away to our southeast, closer to the coast. And if anything came out, they, were, they would have made an attack. Mm -hmm. uh, it never happened, but that's, uh, that's what happened. Now tell me a little bit, you were on other convoys or other places. Uh, um, uh, I see that uh, from your notes, you went to a gyroscope school, you were back in, uh, back in the States. You also went with a, on the same ship. Uh, yes, I signed up again and went with the same ship, the same captain, mostly the same crew. And uh, uh, this time you went to England? We went to England. We were off Halifax on D-Day. And so at that time, we heard that on the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no incidents in that crossing uh, other than uh, heavy fog and some heavy seas. The heavy fog was rather interesting because this is a, 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 a detail that most people don't know about. Uh, when, when you went into a fog in a convoy, you strung out on your stern uh, a sled, like an airplane, it had wings, and a body and a scoop at the end that would shoot up a, a, a plume of water maybe 10 or 15 feet in the air. And water was white when it was like that. And at night, in the fog, uh, with, uh, you would follow the sled and the ship ahead of you. It was very difficult. And it, uh, after a few hours, Everybody lost the sled in front of them. Uh, either they ran it down or they lost it. And every ship had a signal that, that they would blow every minute. And what, after so many hours in the fog, you started hearing signals that didn't belong in your area. So the convoy, essentially, after 48 hours in the fog, was all messed up. And it was all over the sea. And then when you come out of the fog, it's into a clear day. You look back and you'll see a few masts sticking through the fog because it's not too deep. Uh, but deep enough so you can't see. And the corvettes were running all over the ocean, 10, 15 miles, gathering ships, and they weren't happy. Uh, th they yelled at us with uh, uh, very strong vocabulary and uh, told us to get the hell back into the convoy. Did you have any collisions? Uh, no, we didn't have any collisions. Uh, we almost ran a ship down once, mm. but nothing in the... No collisions that I know of in that, uh, in that fog. Well, I I'd like to know uh, also a little bit about the structure of the uh, Merchant Marine. You were an officer. You were trained. You had naval training. You were a commissioned officer. Right. But then there were merchant seamen, as you mentioned, had to buy their own uh, clothing. They were not like Navy sailors who were issued that stuff. Right. Uh, uh, who was, so you were, uh, were you essentially uh, attached, was your commission for the Coast Guard, for the Navy, U.S. Navy Reserve? The, the Coast Guard issues... What's uh, the relationship here? The Coast Guard issues all licenses, both for, uh, for uh, uh, seamen and officers mm -hmm. and engineers. They did then and they do today. Mm -hmm. uh, they have jurisdiction over the maritime right. world, uh, which is an independent world from the, the government's private industry. Sure. But um, uh, we, we had to take our naval courses uh, to get our commission in the Naval Reserve. We took gunnery and navig ship plotting and, mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. Now, how about uh, the civilian seamen? Uh, uh, who were all the way, they were technicians, they were able seamen, they were... There were able people, seamen, people doing very ordinary strong. seamen, there were wipers and oilers in the engine room. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were old timers. Mm -hmm. uh, before the war, there were 55,000 merchant seamen in the United States business industry. Uh, by the end of the war, there were 250,000. Officers came from various maritime, various state maritime academies. Uh, I like to think of New York as being the best. Uh, and then they did form the U.S. Military Academy over in the old Chrysler Estate on Long Island, which mm -hmm. is now known as Kings Point. In 1942, Massachusetts, Maine, I think, 
and the U.S. Maritime Academy boys, there was only a handful, were all stationed with us because there was no place to go in July of 1942. But then they dispersed and went back to their own states or to the, across to the Chrysler Estate or Kings Point. Uh, able-bodied seamen, uh, radio operators. Um, there were all civilians. Yeah, right. Oh. They, 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 there was a place called Manhattan Beach by this time of the war, and they were trained down there in seamanship and such. I remember reading after, long after the war, that the merchant seamen felt, and I had the feeling that they were, to a certain extent, quite right, that they were kind of, uh, didn't get much credit. Uh, they didn't get the GI Bill. They didn't get uh, the, uh, benefits. Uh, for their service, uh, although I presume that you did. Uh, no, no, we didn't, uh, no GI Bill of Rights, and, and you're right. Uh, uh, how, how come you wouldn't qualify? With, because I wasn't in the... In the Navy, in, or in the in military. military. Yeah, in the military, yeah. Uh, if I had gone into the Navy, uh, I, I would have been eligible for those mm -hmm. things. Uh, and yes, uh, I think a lot of us did feel put out. We, we didn't have continue friendships like people in the armed services. They have reunions and stuff like that. Yeah. We had a class reunion from the academy, but I don't know a soul alive that was on any of the ships. Uh -huh. Nobody to talk to but myself. And I'm pretty good at talking to myself. Right. But so on. Uh, how was the pay? Pay was very good. Yeah, that's and that was not my purpose in going to no, sea. No, I understand, but, uh, but uh, I it, you heard the Navy it was people quite, say. It was quite a surprise to me when, when, when we got our paycheck. I was only 20 years old, and uh, when I showed it to my father, he almost said, a fit. Uh, there was no real f feeling with the armed guard that I can remember. Uh, well, you the did the have merchant seamen helped chip the ice off the guns. Sure. Uh, Backed them up if they needed help doing something in mm -hmm. one of the gun tubs. Uh, it was a pretty compatible crew. Yeah. But yes, there there had to be some feeling. There were some armed guard mm -hmm. who were actually Navy people. Oh, they were Navy and people. And so they were right. getting Navy pay. Right, right. As but against they, very they good the pay. reward after right, the war. Right. Yeah. Well, how about some other, other uh, tales? Did you... you well... Know, I see mentions here, barrage balloons... We went to uh, we Normandy, in Omaha Beach. Yeah, someplace around the end of June, and uh, that's uh, uh, we we unloaded into uh, ducks, army ducks. Uh, we had a, a a colored company of um, well, I call them stevedores, but they were army personnel, and they were all armed with with. Uh, 30, ca I think, 30 caliber carbines. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose there were about 200 in the company. And they had white officers. This is when things were still segregated. And uh, they, they would, uh, took to patrolling the ship because they heard that there were Germans in the water. Well, there were bodies floating by every day. This was off Omaha off, Beach. Oh, yeah. Off Normandy, right. And I guess for months they were still finding bodies of people that were killed in the invasion. And uh, for some reason or other, they got together, and they, on their own, without their officer's permission, patrolled the ship. And I was on watch. Uh, th there was always anti-aircraft fire, and the horizon was only was always lit up. You could hear the gunfire. Mm. It was only 10 or 12 miles away, the front. And uh, uh, I, w I was w patrolling the, the after deck, and we had pad eyes, which or heavy pieces of steel with a hole in them that hold the cargo down. And I kept a flashlight covered like this so I could see where they were and I wouldn't trip. And the next thing I knew, I see a barrel sticking into my stomach. <laughs> so I immediately put the light up to my face. Well, an officer's hat could look like a German hat, too. And, uh, but they recognized me. Oh, oh my, oh my. They, but they wanted to know who I was. And they... They learned fast enough, not through me, just recognition. Right. But uh, actually, it, I, it didn't scare me, it startled me. Uh, 
Right. But I could have had my butt blown out or my stomach blown out right, right then and there. And uh, the next day, they had they took their weapons away. Uh, and they were aboard for most of the unloading. And then we moved from uh, Omaha Beach to Utah Beach. And uh, Captain Levitt was a sweet old fellow from Wisconsin, but he wasn't much of a navigator. But he was a great storyteller. And I used to love to stand on the bridge and, and listen to him tell his tales of rum running back in the 20s. And he was in the Coast Guard, and most of his friends were rum runners. <laughs> So he had a little, what you call a conflict of interest, and they were great tales. Uh, I digress. Well, okay, now after Omaha Beach, what's your next posting? Or, I mean, after that run? Yeah, I, I was starting to say something about Captain Levitt. Oh, I, I, go I ahead, forgot sure. what it was. I'd love to hear a tale. Because, as from what I can figure out, telling stories is a good part of yeah, sea duty. Yeah, but my memory sometimes fails me. Uh, it's called a, uh, a senior moment. <laughs> yeah. Were there any great characters on any of your convoy, uh, on that, uh, that, the big convoy? Were there colorful... Uh, oh, I know. Well, let me tell you. So the Captain Levitt, as I said, I, I don't think he was much of a navigator. And we were had received orders, he thought, to go up the... Uh, everything was snafu'd anyhow. Right. Uh, he was received orders to go up the Assigny River. Okay, we'll resume uh, after a slight power interruption. The captain was going up the small river between Utah Beach and right. the other... And at high tide, just before noon on my watch, <laughs> we hit the, the sandy bottom. And you don't want to hit it at high tide because uh, the tides are very, very high, and, and they vary very high in the English Channel. So when the tide went out, we lay on the sand, and there was four feet of water around us, and we had to wait till midnight uh, for the next high tide. And an army tug stood by, and they hooked up lines to us, and we had the engine all ready to go astern. We had to watch to make sure it wasn't in the sand. And the high tide was maybe a little higher than it was at noontime. Whatever it was, we were able to break free. And then we continued unloading. Uh, that was uh, sort of a humorous incident in, in its own now, way. Did the captain get into trouble for that? I don't think during the war anybody got into trouble. <laughs> unless they were killed or something. Yeah. But uh, I, I have no idea what happened to him. Yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure it was on his records. But he was an old man and... Um, but he was Merchant Marine. It was yeah, yeah. He was an old sea captain. Mm -hmm. And a very nice one. Uh, there's another tale about uh, Olaf Osterwald, who was the, uh, the chief officer on both those trips. And when, when, when we first started out, in New York, going back to nineteen to January nineteen forty four, uh, he had me as a young. Not, I was still wet behind the ears, really wet, and immature. And it, my job was to take a seaman and inventory all the lifeboats, the radio, crank radio, uh, food, water, stuff like that. I don't know how the food kept the water kept from freezing, but that's another what story. What was in the lifeboats? Right, now. and then I had to go into the chief mate's quarters and go over this list with him and he would read the list and I loved Norwegians and I loved their accents but I, this fellow had no use for me I was just a young school ship fellow and he uh, uh, was reading through the list in his Norwegian accent and I knew he was very shortly come going to come to the word jackknife and I knew how it would come out and sure enough when it came out, it was a yak knives, and I just couldn't control myself. <laughs> he, he didn't appreciate that either. Yeah. Another incident was that uh, when we were in convoy, uh, being a novice, I probably, we were the lead ship in this column, mm. and I probably didn't maintain station properly, and, and the convoy kind of split. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it was that bad, but it probably was bad enough. And it, uh, after, after midnight, I would write up the uh, bell book, which is before any entries go into the log book. 
And after that, around 20 past midnight, I would go down and have coffee with the third engineer, radio operator, the purser, whoever was around, maybe a few seamen. It was very democratic, maybe even a few gunners. But uh, this, this time I came down and we saw over in the corner the chief mate, Olaf Osterwald, uh, all in his winter coats and a life jacket on and a, and a, and a heavy hat on. And he just looked over at me and he said, you split the convoy. You don't know how to keep station, something in that order. Well, he had good reason for being upset because he had a captain's license and he had been torpedoed in, in the water in a life jacket south of Iceland on the trip before. So he had his reasons for being skeptical of young people who really maybe shouldn't be there <laughs> right. doing what they were doing, but c'est la guerre. <laughs> c'est la guerre. Okay, well, let's wind up this scare with, uh, uh, after you came back from uh, uh, Normandy, where's... Well, the next adventure was, uh, was, was Antwerp. Antwerp was opened up, I believe, by Canadian troops mm -hmm. in uh, late November. And I think the first ship into Antwerp was the Patrick Henry. And we were there within a day or two of the Patrick Henry. And this is when we had our experience with uh, uh, V1 and V2 bombs. Okay, well, they, I didn't they know were just, about that. They were just pouring, from, mostly from Aachen, Germany. They were just pouring them onto Antwerp. This is just prior to the Battle of the Bulge. Mm. And the Germans, purpose of the Battle of the Bulge was was to try to cut right through to the right. coast and get Antwerp because Antwerp was becoming a was the most important port now. Right. And uh, w uh, the first day in the Schult estuary, we were at anchor, talking to the river pilot who hadn't seen an allied uh, uh, an allied person in, since the occupation by the Germans. So we had good chats with him, and he was we were asking about these buzz bombs, and. Suddenly we heard this noise, and he said, that's one. We, we knew it right away. And I, I called them the sound, uh, if you don't mind the expression, a flying fart, because they, they sounded like that. Mm. And, and they were, it was a jet engine, and they had wings, the V1, and they were programmed to go a certain distance. The engine would cut, and then they would come down and explode. And they had, I think, a thousand pounds of explosive. They made a big bang. And this one cut the engine. We ran out on deck to see it, and son of a gun, it cut its engine and then dropped into the mud bank opposite us on the river, in the Schult estuary. And uh, we had many incidents like that. Another one shortly after that flew directly overhead, and we just kept our fingers crossed. And its engine cut out, but maybe a mile further down. They had them fairly well programmed. But the, one of the most interesting things was the V2, That was those were the first rockets yeah. that, that went into space. And they, they had an arc or a trajectory that took them up to about 60 miles. And they were very inaccurate, but they could hit a city and they did an awful lot of damage. Uh, when we were there, uh, some 300 people were killed in a square in Antwerp. Uh, I, I had been to see a movie in the Rex Theater. I still have the ticket tub, stick it tub, stub. And uh, it was a movie about Buffalo Bill, as I remember. I walked out of the theater, got a haircut, as I remember it, in the barber shop next door, went around the corner, and there was a terrific explosion, and the whole theater and the barber shop were disintegrated. So I have a very lucky. Somebody was watching out for me. Uh, there were also a lot of ladies of the night waving us in, and I stayed pretty much away from that sort of stuff. Uh, but they, they were quite obvious. Uh, and then we did hear that there was a, a, a German breakthrough. It wasn't called the Battle of the Bulge. It had no name at that particular moment. And we didn't know too much about it, but we knew that the Germans had, were on the offensive. And we left uh, Antwerp, and it was really raining, these things. Well, one of them, this is the interesting thing that I was going to tell you. I saw it two or three times, but this one was the most interesting. 
uh, I, I went out for a walk and I was maybe half a mile or three quarters of a mile away from the ship. And you're below sea level because the shelled estuary is held back by dikes. And you're quite, it's quite well below sea level, something like 20, 25 feet. And I was walking back to the ship and it was overcast and there must have been three layers of clouds. And I happened to be just looking in the right direction and I saw three V's, V, 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 and then a tremendous explosion. The V's were the compression of moist air by a V1, a V2, the, one of the fast bombs that came from outer space. And uh, if, if you were looking in the right direction, you could see these three Vs. It was one, two, three, as they went through different cloud levels. Wow. And uh, that one landed about less than 100 yards from our ship. And I, the ship disappeared. And I ran back, I thought it hit the ship. I ran back and, and of course everybody was up. They were having supper at that time. But everybody was up and around because that got their attention. And I, I, it, it left a crater, I don't know, 20, 30 feet deep. And but it didn't damage the ship. No, no, but it, it, it broke some portholes, the shrapnel. But nobody was fortunately hurt. Uh, but uh, that's about the extent of uh, V2s. They were also doing that to London. Yeah. It was a cruel thing. It was... Uh, they knew they were going to lose and why they did that. Uh, well, that was Hitler. Yeah, it wasn't military. That's why we had a war, because we had a person like him. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, Antwerp, three bombs, then, you know, then we two, went back. ones. We went back to, uh, we spent Christmas and we left on the 23rd of December and crossed the channel to uh, the Thames and spent Christmas anchored off South End, I think it's called, uh, in the Thames Estuary. And that crossing was kind of hairy. They lost a, a destroyer. Um, and there were, the, Ger the American torpedo boats were called PT boats. Uh, Germans were called E-boats. And I can't say why. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were E-boats in the vicinity to the north and east of us and there was tracer fire, and what they were doing, I don't know, but then there was a report of circling torpedoes, and I still haven't figured that out, but I think they were homing torpedoes. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we didn't uh, encounter anything. Of course, this was, is well after D-Day. Uh, Maybe two you, or three months after. Uh, oh, yes. By yeah. the time of the bulge. Right, like, right. This is yeah. December 1944. Right. And... Uh, was that the extent of? Uh, yeah, that pretty much covers the the, the war the part, of, part of my life. Yeah. Now, how many a, trips did you make? I made three trips across the Atlantic. We stayed over there for a good many months on mm -hmm. two of the trips. And what did so you we do when you were while. staying? Uh, in, in port, South End or Scotland or wherever. Well, I had families to visit. You had families to yeah. I mean, You did get some free time, so you could go to... Uh, I would get a weekend off. I, I took a trip from Swansea in, in Wales, uh, all the way up to Glasgow, something like 400 miles, stood all the way, just loaded with Polish soldiers, British soldiers, a few Americans, uh, and some civilians. And uh, I, I was able to see my grandmother and uncles and aunts and... Uh, and a cousin who I'm going to see in a, in another couple of months. Mm -hmm. Hamish is his name, and uh, we uh, we did such things in a very short time because I only had a few days. Uh, we walked between his school where he had been evacuated to on Loch Lomond, a place called Tarbet, and uh, it's we we walked across the hills to the head of Loch Long where our ship originally was anchored, and that was kind of nice. My aunt and Aunt Mabel and her son Hamish and myself and we listened to two pipers playing to each other in the hills which was uh, meant something to me being of Scottish descent. Was that the high road from Loch Lomond or the low road? Well it was a, it was a steep road but it was a nice walk and we were all younger. That's great. Yeah. Now when were you uh, mustered out? Is, is that the word? When you, uh, did well, you continue to serve in the no after Australia? after the war I was in I wanted to go to the Pacific because there was no more war, war yeah. in New Europe so I I signed on with U.S. lines 
uh, a ship that was built, a small vessel called the Diamond Knot. I don't know how many of these were built, but they were coastal type vessels. And they had three holes forward and a reefer aft or a refrigerator hold aft. And uh, when I was in, I had already signed on, and when I was in San Francisco, VJ Day took place. But we made this trip anyhow, and we went to uh, all over the Pacific. We went to Ulithi, to Manus, to Guam, through the Philippines. And the only reason I'm telling you about this post-war section is that we, uh, when we uh, were heading for Okinawa, we, were, we had gone through the Mindanao Sea, and now we could use running lights. And there was a, a blue light ahead. And, uh, you know, I wasn't used to this sort of stuff. And it happened to be a Filipino fishing vessel. And they were cussing me out because we passed very close to them, far too close. And then we went up the west coast of the Philippines, and w when we get up to the north of Luzon, and this is an interesting nautical experience, the sea, the sky was beautiful, it was clear. Uh, the sky was like, the sea was like oil, it was just nice and smooth. And about half an hour before I, was, I got off watch, uh, I noticed big smooth rollers coming in. They were 20 feet. These were heavy rollers. This is unusual. Well, we had learned in the academy about something about meteorology and, and waves go faster than storms. And it wasn't but minutes later than the radio operator got a message that there was a typhoon to our southeast. Well, this is, and we were up near the Bataan Islands, north of Luzon. And this is the, tor the, the typhoon that wiped out Okinawa. I mean, we were still, it was still fully occupied though the war was over. Aircraft were taking off and everything. And Bruckner Bay was just a shambles when we got there. Sh ships and boats were up on the beach and it was very bad. Uh, some destroyers uh, foundered and lost all hands. Uh, it was a bad storm and it passed to the east of us but we experienced seas 40 to 60 feet mm -hmm. and tremendous winds. And we actually were going, all we wanted to do was keep the engine running because you, you wouldn't survive if, if you lost power and keep your head into the sea. And we actually were going backwards for a few hours. It's and, interesting. Uh, I that was an exciting experience. Two or three naval people and... Uh, not only among the people that I've interviewed in this program, but just friends. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be that about every fourth fellow I've ever met who was in the Navy was in that typhoon. I've heard uh, people talk about it, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it, was, it did a lot of damage. I knew you were going to say it was a typhoon off Okinawa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, the, the one other uh, uh, sea experience was, the, uh, was later on when we got back to Pearl Harbor, uh, the ship belonged to the U.S. lines, U.S. line, and uh, they were going to contract out uh, to do inter-island work for six months. I thought that would be a great idea. I was coming home to get married, but mm -hmm. I thought this sounded even better at the moment. Uh, <laughs> Dorothy, you have to forgive me for that, but I've told you stories about that. And uh, uh, fortunately for us, the contract didn't go through. You don't know what's going on in the business world. You're just a mate on a ship. And our first destination would have been Hilo on the island on the north coast of uh, Hawaii. Well, as it turned out, uh, we headed for Seattle. And about a third of the way there, there was a report of a, a tremendous earthquake in the Aleutians. And I... I it surprises me that they knew as much as they did. I don't remember the word tsunami because I don't think it was used at that time. Uh, a tidal wave. A tidal wave. wave. Yeah. And we, we knew that this tidal wave was going to pass underneath us. And we never saw it because you're out in the deep sea. So the sea may rise and it may fall and all that energy is there, but it doesn't start to take effect until it gets into shallow water where the seas start to reach up and build up to tremendous heights and it just wiped out Hilo, everything. Uh, uh, it was w one of the worst tidal waves that the Hawaii's ever suffered. And that's pretty much the end of my story. I came home, uh, 
got married on June 22, 1946, to uh, my love, Dorothy, and uh, we've been happily married ever since. Well, that's it's a, our 52nd and a half year. That's a very good way to end this little story. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay.